To celebrate hitting 25,000 subscribers and to celebrate the end of the year, from now until the end of 2021, head on over to JG9Shop.com and use the promo code JG92021 for 10% off your order. That's JG92021. We have over 100 products on the store, ranging from t-shirts to hoodies to mugs, so there's something for everyone. Go to JG9Shop.com for your end of the year holiday purchases. And now, on with our feature presentation. This is former NFL head coach Jerry Glanville. I think it's safe to say he's one of the most charismatic figures in the history of professional football. There hasn't been anyone like Glanville before, and hasn't been anyone like him since. And Glanville's definitely ruffled a few feathers and has been involved in his fair share of controversies. There was a time during pregame of a 1998 game at the Metrodome when he was working for Fox that he ran into someone while riding a motorcycle and injured the reporter. There was the time during a 1988 game against the Cleveland Browns when he tried to punch a referee and had to be held back by his players. You can learn more about that incident on Monday Night Football by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And then, there's this incident and bizarre controversy right here. Because in 1999, Jerry Glanville, done with his coaching career, was in the process of switching networks and hopping from CBS to Fox. The only problem? No one knew who he worked for. Fox insisted that Glanville work for them, while Glanville insisted that he work for CBS, and the feud resulted in a bitter spat that left a sour taste in just about everyone's mouth. And this is the story behind one of the craziest controversies in the history of the NFL today on CBS. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand who Jerry Glanville is, where he was before this, and why CBS was so interested in hiring him and bringing him over to their network. As I said before, Glanville is one of the wildest figures in the history of the NFL. Everything about him was not what you'd expect a head coach to act like. However, beyond that facade, Glanville was a pretty darn good football coach. The Houston Oilers were one of the laughing stocks of the NFL during the first half of the 1980s. The Oilers won just 11 games from 1982 to 85, winning an abysmal 19.2% of the time. Glanville became the permanent head coach in 1986, and by 1987, in just his second season, he had guided the Oilers to the postseason. I talked about that 1987 Oilers team in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about them, click the card in the upper right corner. After making the postseason in three straight seasons with the Oilers, Bud Adams, in a somewhat controversial move, decided to fire Glanville. He was immediately picked up by the Atlanta Falcons to be their next head coach, returning to Atlanta after being their defensive coordinator from 1979 to 82. And while this stint wasn't quite as successful as his stint with the Oilers, and came with its fair share of controversy, most notably around the treatment of Brett Favre, he did wind up guiding the Falcons to the playoffs in 1991. Much like the Oilers were before he got there, the Falcons were one of the worst and most forgettable teams in football prior to his arrival, finishing with a losing record in seven consecutive seasons. Glanville helped make them one of the most exciting teams in the league. In Glanville's eight seasons as a full-time head coach, excluding the 1985 season where he was the interim head coach of the Oilers for two games, he made it to the postseason four times, and won two playoff games. He won over 46% of his games, which, while not great on paper, obviously, was pretty good when you consider just how bad both the Oilers and Falcons were prior to his arrival. And even though his background was as a defensive coordinator, he knew how to run a pretty good offense, as his team finished inside the top 10 in points scored five times in eight years, and finished inside the top half of the league in seven of those eight years. By the end of the 1993 season, Glanville was out of a job, and decided to move on to the broadcast booth. And years later, his services would be wanted again by none other than CBS. After the 1993 season, CBS lost the rights to televise NFL games, as they lost the NFC package to Fox. But by 1998, after CBS outbid NBC for the rights to the AFC package of games, CBS was back televising the NFL. And when you're televising the NFL, there's a bunch of crew members that you have to hire, from announcers to cameramen to people to work in the production truck. And one of those groups of people that needed to be filled was the pregame show. CBS had to find a panel to work on the NFL today, and had to find a panel that would be strong enough to beat out Fox NFL Sunday, and maybe even bring the show back to its glory days from the 1970s when they were clearly the top pregame show. This did not happen. Jim Nance was a fantastic studio host as he tried to keep everything together and tried to run a ship that seemed to be sinking faster than the Titanic, but the rest of the panel was awful and left a lot to be desired. CBS decided to hire three analysts, and all three of those analysts had no experience in television whatsoever, which went about as well as you'd expect. Marcus Allen offered nothing. Brent Jones was probably the best of the bunch, but he was uncharacteristically happy all the time and just looked really awkward on camera, especially when sitting next to George Seifert, the most reserved guy of them all. And Seifer was so bad that he was asked in the middle of the season to not show up for work. You can learn more about that train wreck by clicking the card in the upper right corner. CBS knew they had a bad show, they were getting pummeled in the ratings, and they decided to cut their losses after one year, 
deciding that the NFL today needed a complete retooling. Outside of Nance, the only one who was actually good at his job, all three analysts were replaced. Craig James had experience working for CBS already in their studio show for college football, so he was brought on, and the network knew exactly what they were getting with him. Randy Cross had about a decade of broadcasting experience for the NFL, including some time with CBS when they still had the NFC package, so he was brought on. Now the network needed a coach. They needed a guy that could truly dive into the X's and O's, and they needed someone charismatic who was the exact opposite of George Seifert. As you probably guessed, the man that the network wound up turning to was none other than Jerry Glanville. After Glanville was fired by the Falcons following a 1993 season where they went 6-10, he was hired by Fox Sports to be a color commentator. Fox needed to fill a ton of spots on their roster, and outside of a handful of the top guys from CBS, like Pat Summerall, John Madden, Dick Stockton, and Matt Millen, the network decided that they wanted to create their own identity, and hired either young talent or new talent to fill up the remaining spots. Glanville was one of the top guys that the network sought, and he became Fox's number three color commentator, being paired alongside the incredible play-by-play -play man, Kevin Harlan. Hiring a guy like Glanville made a ton of sense. He was definitely a love him or hate him kind of guy, even in the booth, where one article said that Jerry Glanville was an acquired taste, and was what would happen if NASCAR met the NFL. Still, he had an undeniable energy and charisma about him that made him a top target, and made him one of Fox's top color commentators. For all five years that Glanville was working with Fox, whether it was with Kevin Harlan from 1994 to 97, or with Sam Rosen in 1998, he was number three on the depth chart, so we gotta call some pretty good games and some pretty important games. When CBS was looking to retool their pregame show, they wanted a coach with charisma and a coach with experience in broadcasting. Glanville had that in spades. With that, CBS and Glanville reached a deal following the end of the 1998 season that had Glanville move on over to the rival network, and swap out his spot in the booth with a spot in the studio. CBS now had their pregame roster. Everything with this retooling seemed like it was going swimmingly. CBS had broadcasting veterans to pair alongside Nance, and at least knew that there was no way that the show could be worse than it was in 1998, when no one on camera outside of Nance knew what they were doing. There was just one small tiny problem. Fox said that Glanville still worked for them. When Fox got the word that Jerry Glanville was moving on to CBS to join their pregame show, Fox was stunned, because according to Fox, Glanville was still under contract with the network. Obviously, that's a problem, since he can't work for two networks at the same time. Fox claimed that Glanville breached his contract, and the network exchanged paperwork with CBS indicating that legally, Glanville could not join CBS because of this. However, where things get even more bizarre is that according to CBS, Glanville wasn't under contract. According to CBS and according to Glanville, even though Glanville was offered a contract from Fox to stay with the network, he never signed the contract, so he was a free agent that could go wherever he wanted to. You would think that a situation like this would be pretty straightforward. Either Glanville is under contract with Fox, or he never signed the contract and he isn't. However, somehow, no one really knew what the status of Jerry Glanville's contract was. Fox said they still had him, and CBS and Glanville said that this was a complete lie. And what's crazy is that this is not the first time that this has happened with CBS involving a member of the NFL Today pregame show, as a similar controversy with Jane Kennedy occurred in 1980, where no one really knew what Kennedy's contract status was. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. You would think that after that, since it wasn't even two decades ago and was a pretty big deal, that CBS would have learned their lesson. But apparently not, because they were now in a pretty similar predicament. Fox executive Vince Wadika said that the network was considering and examining all of its options, and said quite bluntly, it'll get interesting. Fox already lost Kevin Harlan to CBS the year before, and now if this went through, that would have been two members of one of Fox's top broadcast teams jumping over to the rival network. So when all was said and done in this bizarre controversy, where neither network truly knew who Jerry Glanville worked for, but insisted that it was their network, who did Glanville wind up working for? By the time the 1999 season started, Jerry Glanville found his way onto the eye, and found his way in the studio working for CBS on the NFL Today. From everything that I could find, there was no legal battle that arose out of this. Who knows what network Glanville was truly supposed to be affiliated with in 1999? And who knows whether or not Glanville actually signed that contract with Fox, or Fox was just lying. But regardless, Glanville was on CBS, and it might have seemed like Fox just decided to let him go and work for the rival network. Despite the hassle it caused having to bring in someone else to adjust their roster, and despite the reputation hit they might take from having two of their top broadcasters deflect to CBS within 12 months of each other, from the looks of it, Fox just let Glanville go to CBS without that much of a fight and decided that even despite the aforementioned things and despite the future consequences that could arise out of this, the legal battle that could ensue was not worth it. 
But it's safe to say that Fox was absolutely bitter about how this all played out, and they did not respect Glanville in the slightest bit. Remember that Glanville was the network's number three color commentator for five years, and was their number one color commentator of their original color guys, since John Madden and Matt Millen were brought in from CBS. As polarizing of a figure as he was, he had to be doing something right. Yet Fox had no problem throwing him under the bus when he left. Toward the end of the 1999 season, that same Fox executive, Vince Wadika, was asked about Glanville being on CBS now and whether that worried him, especially when it came to the ratings. Wadika responded quite harshly by saying, The only time we're concerned about Jerry is when he gets behind the wheel, referring to his career as a NASCAR driver or maybe that motorcycle incident from 1998. Whatever happened on the way out, all bridges between Jerry Glanville and Fox were completely burned by this point. Glanville would be on the panel of the NFL Today for three years, serving from 1999 to 2001, before CBS would undergo another retooling after the 2002 season, with Cross, Glanville, and Mike Dicka, who was brought on in 2000, all being replaced. Still, even when he's not on the sidelines, it seems like Jerry Glanville can't do anything without a bit of media attention and a bit of media controversy. CBS was looking to avoid another train wreck after their disastrous 1998 season with their pregame show. And instead, they got another train wreck for a very different reason. And as crazy as this entire situation was, it's just another footnote and a minor blip in the hectic and certainly interesting career of Jerry Glanville. Get your official Jaguar Gamer 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request a future video topics in the description below.